Was Power Rangers RPM really cancelled before it even aired? How did the morphing scenes from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and even Ninja Storm evolve over time? And did Dino Thunder really affect how we saw the Mighty Morphin Green Ranger years after the series? All of that and so much more in today's compilation. Let's kick it. You guys ready to do this? Please consider supporting me on Patreon for extra content and a shout out at the end of every video. Links will be in the description. Enjoy the video. See you! Stop, please! Remember when this happened? Ah! Oh! This was not even a year after Disney gave up entirely. For a series that Disney intended to be the franchise finale, Power Rangers RPM proves the greatest in almost every faction of itself. Along the road, there was a lot of turbulence. From blowing the budget to late scripts, story changes, we're talking about the full history of Power Rangers RPM and how Disney canceled it before it could even start. Ready? In 2001, Disney purchased Fox Family for $3 billion, which also means that they took on the debt that they owed, which was $2.3 billion. <laughs> What an L. At the time, Saban Entertainment, the company behind the creation of Power Rangers, owned half of Fox. This in turn meant that Disney would now be the owners of Power Rangers from then forward. Although this went into effect towards the end of Power Rangers Wild Force, 2003's Power Rangers Ninja Storm would be recognized as the first series of the show to be fully produced by Disney. Disney moved the show's filming to New Zealand, and across the next five to six years, the corporation would pick up where Saban left off, putting out a new series every year as if nothing were different, including Dino Thunder, SPD, and more. Power Rangers always had a certain stigma around it, and concerns thrown around surrounding its nature. Moms and many other big groups often lambasted it for its violence, refusing to allow their kids watch it and demanding the franchise be ended. Being that Disney continued the show immediately following the purchase, these complaints would follow and in some cases even worse considering who was now in charge. Yeah, good one, Michael. Alongside this, there were other things brewing. Mostly rumors that Disney wanted more control over how Power Rangers was handled and the money collected from the property compared to what Toei would receive. However, this has never been outright confirmed. What does appear to have levels of truth, however, is the financial cost of the series. After a while, Disney would decide to drastically dial back on the budget of each individual season, much to the ire of the producers. This infamously led to the Omega Ranger in 2005's Power Rangers SPD, in which the show was unable to hire an actor to play the character in person on screen due to the lack of budget, leading to the Omega Ranger only appearing fully morphed and by voice only. All of this coupled with the violence complaints eventually became too much, with some saying Disney themselves seemed somewhat embarrassed to even be associated with the brand. Former series writer Eddie Guzlian, I, I hope I'm saying your name right. I, I really, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Former series writer Eddie Guzlian saying, it's a complicated issue. I really can't explain Disney's attitude towards the show, but I can definitely from personal experience attest that they act ashamed to be producing it. By the end of 2007's Power Rangers Jungle Fury, Disney was done with the franchise. Bandai, the master toy licensee of the franchise, did their best and persuaded them to continue on in order to keep sales flowing, also offering to help fund the new season itself. But in reality, Disney was actually in a deal, and they they had to make the next season. Like they didn't have it. They didn't have a choice. <laughs> in the following year, Power Rangers RPM would be announced, with the show's producers outright stating that no new series would follow after. We went into it knowing, knowing everybody knew that this was the last season. That this, this was going to be the last season. Disney was done with it. It it changed it. I know Eddie basically went into it, took on the role of executive producer maybe they don't care about it so much i can either really try and make it something great or i can just you know coast and, and get it through and he that's why he really went out on a limb and went right i'm just going to try and do something completely different in 2009 bandai would put out a press release stating that disney would air a slightly reimagined version of mighty morphin power rangers rather than producing a brand new series as per usual oh! in a way disney themselves canceled the power rangers franchise 
before RPM could even begin. Let me put things into perspective. Before 2009, Power Rangers would find its home in ABC Family and Toon Disney and or Jetix primarily. RPM aired on a shoved off ABC Kids channel with little to no promotion at all. And being 10 at the time, I had no idea Power Rangers was even airing. Power Rangers RPM, premiering next Saturday on ABC Kids. Now, is it just me or do I rock? I'd catch it here and there, but never fully enough to register what was going on. It was strange because despite this, my brother and I were fully aware that Power Rangers was still happening elsewhere. That year, my parents took us to the store where we found the morphers. I took home the engine cell morpher, and he got the cell shift morpher. S shift cell, whatever, I don't, never mind. We held on to those for years, as well as other RPM figures but almost never caught the show when it was on. It wasn't until years later with the Shout Factory full series DVD set that I get to fully appreciate it for what it is. Where do you get your spandex? That is not spandex! The material is a self-assembling mouse! Power Rangers RPM is the story of a city in a post-apocalyptic world completely domed off and sheltered from the evil Vengex, an escaped virus created in a lab by the series commander, Dr. K. The show's military uses its force to protect those still living, alongside a team of Power Rangers, also constructed by Dr. K. The story would be fully set up and supervised by a writer formerly versed in older Disney titles, Eddie Guslian. I, again, I hope I'm saying, I really hope I'm saying your name right. If you're watching this, please reach out to me. <laughs> in a 2009 interview with Ranger Crew regarding the series, Guslian would state, the very first meeting I ever had with Disney on the show, they told me flat out that Jungle Fury was supposed to have been the final season of Power Rangers. I don't remember the circumstances exactly, but something involving foreign financing or issues with the toy company had already begun moving forward and put them in a position of being obligated to go ahead with the RPM season. Having never written for Power Rangers, Guzzlian was told by Disney to write something that would appeal to older audiences, and to do something with the show that would set it apart from past seasons. Although he'd enjoyed the source material, Engine Sentai Goonja, he ultimately decided that the googly-eyed, talking zords, and silly nature of the original show would not work with what he'd been instructed. The front of our zords. They're optical field scanning sensors for your cockpit's A2D display. They look like eyes. Big, googly anime eyes. Guzzlian opted to take things in his own direction, creating a desolate world in which the domed city housed the only remaining humans on the planet. It's up to them to put an end to the Vengex virus and keep humanity thriving. Quote, Because it was the final season of the show, the executives at Disney pushed me to shoot for something that was ambitious. They told me to swing for the fences and often reminded me that because the show was essentially already cancelled, I had nothing to lose." End quote. Reality would set in quickly as Eddie attempted to find ways of incorporating the Japanese footage with the new things he could come up with. Ari Boyland, the actor who played Flynn, the Blue Ranger, would state during panels that originally, due to his Japanese counterpart having not much to do in the original series, Guzzlian wasn't sure what to make of Flynn's character. He was told to come in and do whatever he wanted, and the character at one point was almost going to be mute entirely. There was a, there was a, a very brief period of time where uh, my character could have been mute. <laughs> uh, Eddie, Eddie very, uh, very, very nicely in the audition process, um, like we did a couple of different accents, and he's like, okay, cool. Like, you got like a three-page scene with dialogue. He's like, okay, I just want to try something. Just do this scene again, but just do it without saying anything. Like, act out all of these lines, but just don't say anything. How did um, you do it? <laughs> However, even with these slight hiccups, Guzzlian would put his all into the characters, attempting to give them each a full episode titled to that ranger explaining their backstory while coupled with present day events. In the episode Ranger Red, we learn that our Red Ranger, Scott Truman, is felt left out and unappreciated by his father, entrusting important actions to his older son only, who eventually would lose his life in an air battle. Scott longs to not only protect the planet leading his team, but also earn the respect of his father. In Ranger Yellow, Summer is shown to come from a wealthy family, but once the world is under attack, she's forced to humble herself and decides to join the force and become a ranger after a man who once cared for her is lost in the fight. 
Red, blue, yellow, green, and black each have a significant amount of time poured into their backstories that flesh them out without feeling overbearing. Villain Tanaya being a blind girl torn away from her brother in a kidnapping and forcibly turned into a cyborg is tragic and well written to tug at your heart. The story of Dr. K and what she went through alongside our Ranger series Gold and Silver, Gem and Gemma was so well executed that it became my favorite plotline of the series and made Dr. K my favorite character overall in the Power Rangers franchise. What about Ziggy? His morphous signal has gone dead. Would you suggest I go door to door? She's as bad as the machines. Power Rangers is known for filming its own original scenes with actors, sets, and original fights both in and out of the colorful suits while also using many clips and segments of stock footage from the original Super Sentai series it's being based on. However, what stands out most about RPM is the sheer amount of original footage filmed exclusively for RPM rather than being picked from the source material Engine Sentai Go Onger. Aside from the Megazord battles and footage, the shots you'll see from Go Onger is almost slim to none. A good 85% of footage you'll see with just about every passing episode was filmed in New Zealand for Power Rangers. Out of every season of the show up to this point, RPM proved to be the most different, and that it is nothing at all like its Super Sentai counterpart. Eddie Guslian took advantage of the amazing stunt team and cast of actors to do things the franchise had never done before. Most importantly, poking fun at not only the original Super Sentai series, but the entire Tokusatsu genre as a whole, an absurd amount of times. You cruise around in a giant yellow teddy bear, okay? I, I drive a big green fish. Look in the mirror, people. We're in no position to be sitting in judgment of anything weird. This would include jabs at the costumes, insulting the fact that some monsters would literally just be a spray bottle with legs, and he'd even incorporate his own initial reaction to the Zords from Go Onger. Can I just, can I, can I talk about my favorite instance of this real quick? Okay. Throughout the Disney era of Power Rangers, it became very common for the Rangers to end their morph sequence, each striking their specific pose with some sort of pyrotechnic or flashy effect going off in the background. The same would be the case with RPM. I'm telling you, that was just a little one. The tenth episode, Ranger Blue, a reversal glitch interferes with Flynn's main abilities, prompting Dr. K to shut him offline. Later on, Flynn comes up with the idea of reversing the glitch by inserting his engine cell into the morpher upside down to create a runoff explosion so big it links him back to the morphin grid and breaks the issue entirely. No, Guzzlian would flesh his characters and story out as much as possible, all the way up to his final episode writing near the end of the series. Oh yeah, did I, did I mention he was fired by Disney? The official reasoning for why has never quite been clear, but there has been mention of episode scripts being untimely and going over budget a few times. However, miscommunication from Disney could also be a big factor. None of the executives I worked for have ever stepped up to give any real explanation to myself or to my agent of what happened or exactly why I was removed from the show. It's a complicated issue involving the politics of a long-running show, money, and a host of other factors that I honestly do not fully understand. Nevertheless, after Eddie was canned, former series writer Chip Lynn would step in his place. Being that Disney and staff never asked Guzzlian for his input on how he'd have wanted the show to progress and end, Many plot lines that had, had their story beats set up for the spike were left falling to the ground as Chip went on his own way. This includes a possible plot line following the reveal that Flynn's father was once the RPM Blue Ranger. And according to the actress behind Tanaya, Adelaide Kane, her character was at one point supposed to gain her own morpher and join the team. I've only ever had good things to say about Eddie, and when Chip came in, we didn't get a background episode, so. <laughs> well, the only reason the show was as dark as it was and was so unusual is because um, Eddie, Eddie had creative control before Chip came in, and I, I'm not going to bandy about or beat around the bush. Like, I'm yeah, an Eddie stan, 110%, and the changeover was very, very difficult for me, personally. And I would have gotten my morpher. <laughs>
A certain set of episodes became somewhat more flat and to the point, based mainly on retrieving new zords at points and staying focused on one single objective with little character interaction. Multiple episodes to which most of the shots are comprised of the rangers like this huddled around Dr. K listening and nothing else. And even an episode in which Big Batty, Shifter, has control over Scott for all of one minute, attacking no one and the issue being resolved not even halfway through the runtime, leading to a big battle that ends in a helmetless shot for no, no reason at all. <laughs> The change, while not frustrating, is very noticeable. Despite this, RPM would continue on with the notion that it was indeed still intended to be the franchise finale, even relegating an entire episode to being a behind the scenes special. Highlighting the choreography, delving into the special effects and how they're executed, and a blooper reel, all while the characters are still in actor. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All while the actors are still in character. It's fascinating that even with the show being Disney's last stand with the suited heroes, that through this episode they at multiple points make it very clear how safe the production is when it comes to its violence. Characters like Scott and Summer have lines flat out stating that they are very careful and that everything is meticulously planned out before anything goes into play. What also took me aback was how symbolic this episode ended up being. The only behind the scenes episode in Power Rangers history, as well as the only one to highlight the hard work and dedication put into something like this, and it's during this series that was meant to cease production of the franchise as a whole after it was over. This is an actual quote from Ika Darville, RPM's Red Ranger Scott Truman during the episode. What makes Power Rangers unique, you ask? It's not just our moves, it's the camera's moves. Moving the camera adds to the excitement and fuels the energy. We also add music, special effects, props, and some good old acrobatics. You put them together and you have the most exciting stunt sequences on television. Hey, let's watch. Get in gear. Power Rangers RPM would air on ABC Kids throughout 2009 with little to no promotion at all. Almost as if Disney didn't even want people knowing that this show was coming. They even decided not to put out a press release regarding its announcement while Bandai themselves did. Regardless of the outcome, RPM would immediately become adored by fans, praising its turn away from how Power Rangers normally goes throughout its stories. Some call it dark, I tend to- well I have- I, I mean it's kind of dark. Anyway, I tend to call it refreshing. It's different. It's the exact sort of kick in the face the show needed from someone who ended up being the only one that could do it. RPM is a must watch, not just for its score, not just for its characters or its plot lines, but for its heart and ambition. Will you get in gear? Time to find out how much stronger Vengeance really is. <laughs> you know what my favorite dynamic on the show was that was real funny, that kind of went into but then didn't? Was Flynn and Gemma, Gemma mm. like kind of starting this thing, yeah, and then Jim getting this <laughs> real <laughs> creepy, jealous vibe on. Yeah. Like, right. I remember like <laughs> the cutaways from <laughs> for Mike. I'm just like, okay, cool, see you later, and then turn around, and he's just standing like <laughs> daggers, like daggers in the back, like, yeah, disappears. <laughs> that was hilarious. I actually had a lot of fun with that, but w I mean, were they brother and sister? Yes. Yeah, they're twins. Yeah, they're twins. <laughs> it was a protective thing, okay? Gotcha! Triceratops! Tyrannosaurus! Since 1993, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers have been showing up to the scene in style, appearing again and again throughout the years. But just what happened to that original morphing sequence? And how has it changed over time? Hop aboard the Rainbow Line. It's our next station. Power Rangers began in 1993 as an adaptation of the Japanese franchise Super Sentai. Here in America, we'd be given footage of the Rangers in Japan fighting while suited up, splice it with the newly filmed American footage, and thus create a retelling of the story for Western audiences. This being the case, there needed to be a smooth transition between our heroes being presented fully on camera to the helmeted costume Rangers filmed in Japan. Thus, the morphing sequence was born. Or, or adapted. Well, 
Similarly to the method used in the Japanese counterpart, the transition scene from an American civilian on camera to a ranger fighting in a suit was filmed specifically for the purpose of being reused again and again throughout every episode, as opposed to having to film a new scene every time. Cost cutting and effective. This can first be seen as early as the pilot episode. The morphing sequence from the pilot episode uses brief footage from its Super Sentai counterpart before overlaying American footage of our actors throwing up their power morphers and shouting the name of their dinosaurs. Once Mighty Morphin Power Rangers would officially hit the scene, we'd be greeted with a new morphing sequence with a style all of its own. Each actor poses, brandishing the power morpher, enclosed within an enlarged power morpher with lightning filling inside. As evident from the branding, thunder and lightning were very much a big part of Power Rangers' visual identity. We can hear lightning strikes throughout every episode, including fights, as well as the morphing sequence itself. The actors are also wearing clothing of a solid color, meant to be keyed out. This is to dispel any continuity issues, being that the clip is to be used throughout the entire show and the characters obviously would be changing their clothes from day to day. Hence why we only see the morpher, their head, and their arms. As the morph begins, each ranger shouts out the name of their designated dinosaur one after another. Mastodon, Pterodactyl, Triceratops, Sabertooth Tiger, and ending with Tyrannosaurus. The sequence then concludes with partial stock footage from the Sentai counterpart, Ju Ranger, in which the Red Ranger's helmet is formed out of a wireframe. However, this ending shot is only ever present if the Red Ranger himself is present. Otherwise, the morph will end with a flash fade to white and transitioning into the suited footage. It's morphin' time! Mastodon! Oh man! Mastodon! The order that the rangers call out their zords nearly always remained consistent, even when only a few of them were called into battle as opposed to the full original five. It's morphin' time! Triceratops! Saber 2 Tiger! It's morphin' time! Mastodon! Saber 2 Tiger! When Tommy Oliver entered the scene as the Green Ranger, his call would always be placed at the front before Zack, and would strangely feature a split second of white before the rest of the team would continue. This is possibly just a leftover frame from when his scene was filmed separately. A nice attention to detail, the morpher that Tommy is filmed inside of also has the gold coloring, matching the power morpher he'd use in the series. This would remain consistent throughout each season of the show he'd be a part of. Well, Mighty Morphin, at least. Okay, anyway. <laughs> we rarely would ever see our heroes pulling their power morpher out, as it would generally be assumed that it's always kept behind them on their belt buckle hence the hand behind their back when morphing. However, any time we would get to see it was a treat in and of itself. Going to morph. Tiger! In season two, as Tommy returned, donning the new white tiger powers, he would of course have a new morphing sequence filmed, but this time a bit differently. Morphin time. Tiger Zord, Triceratops. While the general structure is the same, Jason David Frank would not be wearing the green cloak and instead a white t-shirt. While this would eventually become the standard for a while after the original Ranger cast would be partially swapped out, it stuck out pretty harshly in the beginning as no other character had their transformation scenes refilmed. As just mentioned, Austin St. John, Tui Trang, and Walter Jones, Jason, Trini, and Zack respectively, left the series as they protested for better pay and their characters were subsequently replaced with newcomers, Rocky, Aisha, and Adam. Tiger Zord, Mastodon, Pterodactyl, Diver 2 Tiger, Tyrannosaurus! Their morphing scenes followed the same structure as Tommy's, being filmed in a shirt matching their respective ranger colors. This would last all the way up to the gang achieving their new ninja powers, first debuting in Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie and soon transitioning into the series itself. I am the ape! I am the bear! I am the wolf! I am the crane! I'm the frog! I am the falcon! The morph into Ninja Rangers introduces a new starting pose, drawing a half circle and ending with whatever this is. Ninja 
What's interesting about the ninja powers is that the morph is somewhat less elaborate than what we'd known before, now being a simple image transition between a half mask character to a full mask character and literally nothing else. The music even starts and usually stops immediately afterwards, not even lasting for three seconds if one ranger is entering the battle on their own. <laughs> It's also somewhat evident how just whatever their morph call was, as Tommy often would switch up the order of words whenever they'd need their super abilities. Ninja Ranger Power now! Ranger Ninja Power now! Ninja Power now! Ranger Ninja Power now! Queen Ninja Power now! White Ninja Power now! Ninja Ranger Power now! Alright, I get it! Ninja Ranger Power now! Ranger Ninja Power now! Power, power Ninja Ranger! Morph! <laughs> let's, let's do it. <laughs> the Power Rangers were in need of the ninja abilities after Rito Revolto destroyed the Dinozords. But after channeling their ninja powers, they'd also be granted the ability to don their original ranger suits once again, leading to one of the more almost convoluted sequences we've ever had, where the rangers are morphing with their original background, but while fully suited in the ninja outfits, and ending with the respective ranger helmet zooming into the screen. All right, they, they, they really just, they needed a reason just to have the ranger suits back again. They were like, I don't know, just make it happen. It's morphing time! White ranger power! Black ranger power! Pink ranger power! Blue ranger power! Ah, and I get it! Anytime after this, if the rangers were zooming right into their original dinosaur powers instead of the ninja abilities, they of course would no longer shout the Zord's names as they, I mean, like they were literally destroyed. <laughs> so they'd instead shout their ranger color and would now be wearing the keyed out cloak again. Oh, and also the camera would zoom in on the character's face a second late sometimes and it looked really funny. <laughs> it's more for time. <laughs> so I didn't put this in the script because I, I don't remember exactly what part of Mighty Morphin this happened in. Probably season three, the metallic ranger suits, when they got the metallic ranger powers and it was literally just a, a, a like a glittery <laughs> suit. <laughs> Their morph was also very just nothing. They were standing there and then something happened and then now the suits are there. It was very akin to the ninja powers where they, they didn't really have much time to film something, it seemed like. So they just did it and it was like, whatever. It, it was it was there to sell toys, okay? In Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie, slight redesigns of the Power Morpher were utilized as the rangers each call out their original dinosaur hold the morpher forward and the coin flies towards the screen. The fully morphed ranger would then strike a modified version of their signature pose from the series. After Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the morphing sequences for later teams became more visually engaging as editing technology and budget would advance. However, Mighty Morphin would remain a team with a morph so unique it almost couldn't stand on its own in future legend crossovers. When Adam makes a cameo appearance in Power Rangers in Space and attempts to use a damaged Power Morpher, a new morph had been filmed showing the original background from Mighty Morphin, but with new footage of Adam throwing up his Morpher. In Jason's Forever Red reappearance from Power Rangers Wild Force, the production team would reuse his original morph from season one as opposed to filming a new one. Six years later in Power Rangers Oper- wait, was that right? Six years? If it wasn't, just put the actual name, put the actual time frame on the screen, please. Six years later in Power Rangers Operation Overdrive, during the Once a Ranger crossover, Adam would be given a brand new morphing sequence, now being filmed in front of a green screen while the Black Ranger suit materialized on top, ending with the helmet attaching in front of a superimposed power morpher. This new morph put together by the Disney production team perfectly encapsulates the imagination of the original morph while keeping its integrity intact, beautifully pulling elements from the original and evolving from it. With earth and gravel reacting around him signifying the Mastodon's power, at that point this was the most elaborate reimagining of the morph for a Mighty Morphin Ranger. Power Rangers Ninja Steel would show the first on-field morph for a Mighty Morphin Ranger as Tommy returns wielding the Master Morpher to become the original green and white rangers. Tiger Sword, white ranger power! 
Dragon Sword! Great Ranger Power! In Power Rangers Beast Morphers, Jason returns yet again as the Red Ranger, and the morph also is on field, being a standard show of glowing effects. It's morphin' time! This would also be the case for the 2023 Netflix special, Once and Always, except here we'd see what looks to be the power surging from the Morpher itself and onto the character, as well as a fully refilmed recreation of the original Morph from the first three seasons of the series. All right then, it's Morphin' time! Over 30 years, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers have served a cultural phenomenon across the world. The visuals are unique, and no matter the time period, as long as we remember what time it is, the world surely doesn't stand a chance. I said get out of my face! Who's gonna make me? I am, you geeky pencil neck, poor excuse for a Guys. human! I don't know how many times I've said it, but I've grown up with Power Rangers all my life. All, almost except for the first. I'd catch it here and there on ABC Family and JetX, but didn't get to fully watch the entirety of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers until getting the Collector's Edition back in 2018, which contained the first three full seasons and the Alien Rangers miniseries. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was interesting. Well, rather, that entire watch through was something in and of itself, but it was interesting in that it was very primitive. You could tell that they were just throwing things at the wall to see what stuck, and that added its own charm. At the same time, the further you went into the show, you'd start to notice just how samey things got. Like, at a certain point, so many episodes in a row ended up feeling like filler in some way. I mean, how many times do we have to do a fish-related episode? I'm being so for real right now. When season two hit, though, things got crazy. The show introduces us to the Thunderzords, upgraded versions of the dinosaurs that have almost nothing to do with dinosaurs at all, created by Zordon and Alpha. Jason, you will control the Red Dragon Thunderzord. His power is fierce and true. The Rangers are able to call upon the Thunderzords by transforming their normal dinosaurs into them, and oh my god, it was so hype. The scene of the Rangers helmetless looking into the sky as their new Zords await them is sick, followed by them calling them out for the first time. It was a level of excitement I was hoping for with the first iteration of Rangers, and it stood its ground. Those first few times it happened were unmatched. And then it happened again. And again. And again. And then you start to realize, wait a minute, they, 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 weren't, they weren't in a rock quarry when they realized they needed their Zords. But, but now they are. Wait, 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 is it, isn't this the same roll call footage from when Tommy first joined the team as the Green Ranger like a full season ago? They, they are reusing this roll call footage for them calling the Thunderzords every single episode as stock footage. And the clip itself is literally like an entire minute long. And of course, I mean, it, it's not unheard of. That's just what stock footage is. That's what Power Rangers does. But when you start to take into account just the fact that with Mighty Morphin, the Zord fights themselves essentially act as filler, it, it starts to get a bit much. I myself got to a point where I never even wanted to see the Zord fights anymore. Not because they were bad, but because they were always the same. They call the Zords... <laughs> The Zords transform, they beat the monster, and then we fade back in either later that day or the day after at the end. And nothing made me want to skip ahead more than when I saw that little blue streak of lightning pop up. I just knew that we was finna watch an entire minute, not including the Megazord transformation of them just bringing the Zords out. The moment I heard Zack go, lion, I was like, I'm not trying to hear all that and skip five minutes. Or since I played the episodes on my PC, I just hit the next chapter and it immediately zipped to them sitting at the juice bar. It always ended with a fade in back at the juice bar. I tell you what though, folks, that's bloody nice. It got even worse when the new Rangers came in and replaced the former ones because nothing was different. They just used the same footage, but just dubbed it over with the new actors. Until eventually deciding to film an entirely new roll call in America, but with the same Zord transformations. It was so maddening. Pencil neck, poor excuse for a Guys. human. This is how many times this full minute scene played in the show. Now you can sit through it if you want to, but I'm not, I, I was not having it. 
I'm not nearly as mad as, as it seems. I, I just, I thought it was funny. I cannot wait for someone on Facebook to see the thumbnail of this video and the title and just absolutely start ranting to me about how I was being too hard on Mighty Morphin, how I just hate Mighty Morphin without having even watched the video. If you see this happen, please go in the comments and just say, I knew it. <laughs> please just do it for me, please. I don't even know how to end this video. Deep in the mountains and many years past, it's been a long time since now. Ninja Storm, Ninja Storm, let's go. Remember the morph? Ninja Storm, Ranger Ranger Storm. Ha, ha, ha. Here on this channel, we go over and analyze the little details that go into such a spectacle. Today we're focusing on Ninja Storm and every little thing you can imagine. From how the poses change from the Japanese counterpart, to the effects, to how they all can affect the scene. Let's take a ride together. When it comes to a morphing sequence, no one does it better than Ninja Storm. And if you know me, then you know my love for Dino Thunder. But even that series takes a backseat to what Ninja Storm brings. Power Rangers Ninja Storm was the first season of the franchise entirely built up under the hands of Disney after Power Rangers had been sold from Saban. Being the first to be fully filmed in New Zealand as well as the start of a new generation, Disney took the reins and essentially continued on as if nothing had even happened. With the nature of Power Rangers, more often than not, the Rangers morph into their suits together as a team. Starting back in the beginning with Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the one leading the morph would often signal the others by simply shouting, it's Morphin time. This would continue through Zeo until Turbo switched the morph call to shift into Turbo. Shift into Turbo! Afterwards, the leader would instead shout ready and either wait for a response or continue on without one and into that season's new morph call. This is no different with Ninja Storm. The pose used for Ninja Storm's morph, as with nearly every season of Power Rangers, is a slightly modified version of what was used in its Super Sentai counterpart, this being Nippu Sentai Harikenja. Nippu! Ninja Storm decided to speed up the process, creating a more dynamic and, dare I say, lightning fast approach to the sequence itself. Ninja Storm Danger Form, it's Ranger Form is the name of the game, and its phrasing would be used for the first three rangers to appear on the show, Shane, Tori, and Dustin, the air, water, and earth wind rangers respectively. After spinning their discs, the rangers appear surrounded by a powerful tornado and revealing their new suits from underneath their ninja garb. The ninja outfits are shown in the stock morph footage even when not being worn at that point in the episode. The rangers then receive their helmet crest that then fully forms the helmet with the visor and mouthpiece connecting separately. What's so nice about the helmets in Ninja Storm is that not only is the visual of their helmets without the visor so cleanly done compared to any other season of the show that showed it during the morph, but it most likely came out that way due to the fact that this does happen often in the season itself. Ninja Storm becomes the first season of Power Rangers to introduce and modify the Rangers' signature Sentai pose at the tail end of every morph, something that would eventually become a Disney tradition. The startup to the pose for each Ranger is done with a CG model, ending with a shot of the actual suit performer. Also fun fact, the red and yellow Rangers' signature poses were changed entirely when brought over for Power Rangers, possibly to better demonstrate the powers they possess, that being the movement of air as well as the strength of the earth. Yellow's original pose, however, can still be seen in the show's first opening. Not long into the series, we're introduced to the Crimson and Navy Thunder Rangers, Hunter and Blake. Being from the Thunder Ninja Academy compared to Wind, their morph is slightly different. Thunder. 
with Thunderstorm Ranger form being their call, they appear in a dark area with their shoulder and knee pads growing onto them through the power of lightning. What's cool is we actually see their individual morphers superimposed, and as they raise both arms, the crests from their morphers end up becoming the crests for their helmets. They both raise an arm high, striking a lightning bolt as their helmet crests fall onto their face. Both of their official poses would also differ from their Sentai counterparts, although Navy Thunder's original pose can still be found during the team-up fight with Dino Thunder and would be incorporated here and there throughout different parts of the show. Even further into the season and one of the most anticipated moments of the entire show, the character Cam is given the ability to morph after his long-held desire to join the team. After calling out Samurai Storm Ranger form, he set in a Japanese-style setting on his knees, with his armor falling onto him, creating his suit, and his helmet piecing together from its front and back halves, brilliantly illustrating his ability to power up by switching which side of his helmet is facing forward. Each faction of Rangers has their own unique morph call, despite ending in the same fashion. Usually with Power Rangers, this can cause some disjointedness, a word that looks absolutely bizarre on a script. This is proven by series such as Lightspeed Rescue, in which the Titanium Ranger having his own call separate from the team meant that his morph normally would have to be followed after everyone else's as opposed to being alongside them. However, Ninja Storm remedies this in the best way possible. Rather than having each faction perform individually, they, in order, wait for their cue and follow the previous set of rangers before initiating theirs. The order remains consistent even when the number of rangers present is lessened. This synergy is strong and creates a specific rhythm never seen in the Power Rangers franchise before this point. Something about this is very stimulating and flows together insanely well. The idea to string each formation of Rangers in this way was wonderfully thought out in a way that keeps the momentum of the episode going without breaking pace. Made even more interesting being the fact that after Ninja Storm, something like this would never really happen again. It seems purely a result of the show's theming, having five rangers not all meant to have been part of the same group. It truly was lightning in a bottle. Yes, see, I knew it, dude. I was right. Although its rangers would rarely make return appearances after the season's run, the morphing sequence itself would remain the same, never being refilmed. Ninja Storm has a morph unique to itself, lending dynamic visuals to a fan favorite series. It began Disney's run of the franchise and gave the time period a worthy kickstart, with the speed of the wind and strength like thunder. It's growing. Growing. I, 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 there was no cool way of saying that. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I must. There is no other choice. We all remember that iconic Green Ranger suit, but did you know that after its appearance in Dino Thunder, it would look quite different in a variety of ways that lasted for nearly 15 years? And no, we're not just talking the helmet. Ready? Dragon Sword! What we know today as the iconic Mighty Morphin Green Ranger of course first appeared in the Japanese Super Sentai series, Kyoryu Sentai Ju Ranger. When Mighty Morphin Power Rangers came to the scene, Saban went to work creating their own Green Ranger suit for original footage. The powers would be entrusted to Jason David Frank's character, Tommy Oliver, and the finished result very much highlighted the budgeted nature of the production at the time. As opposed to the somewhat hard foam pieces used for various areas of the original Japanese design, the team opted to go with more of a cloth material. This included the gold armbands and the dragon shield. The triangles on both the arm gauntlets and boots also featured a shade of green much darker than the spandex itself. Regardless, the design once popular in Japan also made its stay in American pop culture as well as one of the most recognizable aspects of the Power Rangers brand and the 90s as a whole. 
The Mighty Morphin Green Ranger would appear throughout Seasons 1 and 2 of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, before Tommy Oliver would take on the new White Ranger powers for the rest of the series. A full 10 years later, in 2004's Power Rangers Dino Thunder, the character Tommy Oliver would return as a paleontologist, mentor, and later Black Ranger to the team. In the 27th episode, Fighting Spirit, Tommy has a violent dream after having been put into a coma from past events in the season. During the dream, he encounters and battles the past ranger powers he's donned before, including the Red Zeo Ranger, Mighty Morphin White Ranger, and the Mighty Morphin Green Ranger. Being the length of time since its last appearance, as well as the materials used to create it, the Disney team opted to have an entirely new suit put together for the episode. Dino Thunder's Mighty Morphin Green Ranger appearance very infamously sported many inaccuracies, first of note being the helmet. The helmet now featured a silver stripe along the eyes and nose of the dragon. The exact reasoning for its inclusion appears to still be somewhat of a mystery, but has led to fan theories and headcanons including this appearance meaning Tommy's full mastery over his powers and acceptance of his past. The suit here now more closely resembles that of its original design from Japan's Jew Ranger, with the dragon shield and armbands now being of a foam material. The dragon shield, although freshly new, appears to fall apart during the episode, with the base diamond becoming detached in multiple shots. Continuing with inaccuracies, the Green Ranger now has a white holster for the dragon dagger on the right side of his belt as opposed to the original black holster from Mighty Morphin and Drew Ranger that was placed on the left. However, one glaring error is the Morpher. Tommy's original Power Morpher has always been recognizable not only for the Dragon Coin, but the Morpher itself being gold rather than the silver of its fellow Ranger team. In Dino Thunder, however, the Mighty Morphin Power Morpher is silver instead. This suit would be kept for a long time after Dino Thunder. Following Saban's repurchasing of the Power Rangers franchise from Disney in 2010, the Green Ranger suit from Dino Thunder would follow and now be in the hands of Saban. You passed the test. 2014's Power Rangers Super Mega Force saw cameo appearances of many past Ranger actors donning their former powers, including Jason David Frank, who reprised his role as Tommy while utilizing the Green Ranger powers. Here we see the Dino Thunder iteration of the Green Ranger's suit once again, telling by the armbands, the shield, and overall resemblance, especially including the helmet. Although it appears fully green in the episode and close to its original look, the silver stripes molding is in fact still present, meaning that the helmet is indeed the same but had to be color corrected. You can even see the helmet in its unedited fighting spirit look in behind the scenes photos from the production. Not only this, but the Power Morpher is still silver and would also have to be fixed in post throughout the episode. These color corrections would be added for nearly every shot featuring original footage. The only real changes for the design being the holster for the Dragon Dagger, which would be changed with one closer resembling its original look from Jew Ranger, being black and now placed on the correct hip. This wouldn't be the last time we'd see the Fighting Spirit Green Ranger, however, as in 2017, the release of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Season 1 Volume 2 DVD released by Magna Entertainment features a cover with a new shot of the Green Ranger, complete with the silver stripe fully present on the helmet as well as the inaccurate Morpher color. How do you do that? <laughs> How do you allow that to happen? <laughs> In the complete Season 1 DVD set release of the series from the same company, another new shot of the Fighting Spirit Green Ranger would be utilized, but this time with both the helmet and morpher color corrected. The 2018 anniversary episode of Power Rangers Ninja Steel sees Jason David Frank as Tommy for the final time and the return of the Green Ranger now with an entirely new suit. After 14 years, the Dino Thunder iteration is no more, as we see a new bodysuit, Dragon Shield, Gold Morpher, and Helmet nearly fully accurate to its original appearances in both Mighty Morphin and Drew Ranger. In 2023's 30th anniversary feature, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Once and Always, the Green Ranger appears for the first time since the unfortunate passing of Jason David Frank, with what appears to be another new suit. The green used appears to be somewhat of a lighter shade, and the armbands receive a slightly updated design overall. Good luck, Black Ranger. Ranger, Ranger, Ranger. 
Despite the various changes over the years, the Mighty Morphin Green Ranger is an iconic memory held dear in the hearts of many across the globe. One that will continue to live on as long as at least one person knows what time it is. Let's do it guys, it's Morphin time! The what, the what ifs I, I don't like in life because I don't think we would be where we're at if we had a chance to go back in life. I wouldn't change who I am and what I've gone through in life because it made me stronger. And, I, and we talk a lot about mental health. It's okay to have that. We just have to work through it and push through it. It makes me a stronger person. It really, truly does. Alicia, Andrew, Austin, Disney Captain, Donnie, Emilia, Helen, Ian, Junior the Hedgehog, Matthew, Mia T. Toon, 